Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jen Ward-Clark of the Caribbean Permaculture Research Institute in Barbados. If you are joining us for the first time, this is Wired's live living room sessions, brought to you by Walker's Institute for Regenerative Research, Education and Design in collaboration with CPRI and powered by the Inter-American Development Bank. We have been hosting this space for the past few months to bring you conversations on climate change, biodiversity, regenerative agriculture, and renewable energy. This week, we are bringing our twice weekly sessions to a close and hope that you will be able to join Keisha, Patrick, and myself, our team, this Thursday as we wrap up all of the discussions we have had thus far with our wide variety of experts in an episode entitled, Creating Meaningful Change, What Role Should You Be Playing? If you haven't been keeping up with us over the last few months, shame on you, but luckily you can always catch up on everything that we've been chatting about by heading over to Wired's YouTube channel where all of our videos are available. Don't forget to click subscribe while you are there. Today, I'm thrilled to be welcoming one final expert to our stage to have a discussion around a hot topic, regenerative agriculture. Though there are many methods of farming in a regenerative, regenerative way, syntropic farming, a method of regenerative agroforestry, is gaining international attention in a big way right now, and for good reason. Today, we are welcoming the very experienced Tiago Barbosa to our session to give us the ins and outs of syntropic farming. Tiago's dedication to spreading the knowledge of syntropic agriculture and farming is clear today as he has graciously dragged himself out of bed to speak to us all in the middle of the night in Australia where he currently resides. Please join me in welcoming Tiago to our session. Hello. Hi Tiago, how are you doing? I am awesome, how are you? <laughs> Pretty good, not as tired as you I'm sure. Thank you so much for joining us in, joining in with us in the middle of the night. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm loving it, thank you, thanks for <laughs> the opportunity. Great. So I'd like to get our session started by uh, chatting a bit about yourself. Um, we'd love to hear your story and, and your background, how you got involved in Syntropic, in the Syntropic farming world. I think that um, since the year 2000, a lot of people are looking for new meaning for life. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, I live in Byron Bay uh, in Australia, what we call the Green Belt of Australia where there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of people looking to eat in health, um, looking for uh, healthy practices. And, and then I got exposed to a few questions in life. Uh, where Where is the food that I'm eating coming from? Um, you see a lot of my friends uh, here where I, where I live, that's where permaculture was created. So a lot of my friends, they leave this permaculture lifestyle and always looking into doing better practices in their life. And then just by going around and going from place to place, seeing beautiful gardens, beautiful food gardens here and there, uh, these quests from inside out start rising, you know? Um, wh what am I doing with my life? Okay, being a stockbroker, <laughs> being a skydiver, being a um, businessman, and then trying to, trying to find meaning for my life. And when you go and work one day, put your hands in the soil, and you have that feeling of connectivity, and you're part of the whole thing. You see that little bugs, little mi that micro life, and you see how beautiful that whole micro things are fully connected to the food that you eat. And then you ask exp explanations. And then I start researching more about uh, permaculture, biodynamics. And, and um, t in my walks in life, I haven't seen any large scale permaculture, or what I can say is um, fully. Uh, commercial permaculture garden right. and for me it's pretty much if uh, I always had this in my mind if I'm gonna go green there is no point of being red in the red <laughs> you know? so yes economically um, 
Yeah, exactly. So yes. I started looking what would be a way that I could learn about this beautiful way of living and make a living out of it. And when I saw a video of syntropic farming, people doing that in lines and the explanation that was given to me, uh, it all relates to all this agroecology. It's all under the same umbrella. But I my you know when you see something and your your skin your your blood start boiling and said okay that's excite me and then I saw mm -hmm. that it was happening in Brazil so my my home country I went there just um, went for it <laughs> dived into it <laughs> bought a flight ticket and spent a month in Brazil learning. And then came back here, realized that it's bigger than I thought. I didn't learn anything in this month, so I had to go back there. And since then, it's um, it's uh, as everyone who are in this uh, life path know that is ne it's a never ending learning process. So you're always yes. learning. Yeah, and I'm still learning. I'm a student of life, and I'm still learning. That's great. Well, it's great to hear that story. I think you've partially answered my first question, which was really why for you is syntropic agriculture the answer? So I, I, I've heard bits and pieces, but if you can give us a little bit more information about weighing up against some of the other options that you might have found. So you talked about permaculture. Um, surely there are actually probably somewhere up in 15 or 20 different types of regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, why, why have you zoned in on cent centropy, as it's called, um, as that main one for you? For me, the... It's a long uh, explanation for this question, but to be very uh, quick here, let's say life has a direction of movement. Life has an agenda. Life wants to keep life alive and life is always transforming and evolving. And within syntropic farming, I really understood that nature it's trying to bring back the skin of the planet, trying to make the forest back to the land again. Absolutely. And with syntropic farming, I could see that this is uh, uh, growing food is just a sub product of a well designed and a well planned and a well managed system. So nutritious food abundance is just a subproduct. The main thing that we want to achieve is make the engine that drives this planet, that's the forest, mm -hmm. uh, be resilient, biodiverse, and uh, as, like get the engine to work. So for me, syntropic farming, it's not only uh, a way to grow food, a way to do reforestation, a way to, uh, for me, it's a way of seeing things, how they really are, how life performs, and how we can be part of this beautiful mechanism that makes life thrive in this planet. So for me, uh, uh, syntropic agriculture, it's, I, I could start naming here, like nutritious food, mm -hmm. um, you have a beautiful landscape. You have a multi-layered yeah, la forest and uh, improved soil conditions. So I could go on and on and on and on, but all of these is, are just sub-products of this way of living and how to be part of a planet of, that we live in, you know? Absolutely, great answer for that one. Um, so just so for our audience as well, we have talked a lot about permaculture throughout our sessions thus far. Um, we, as a, as a permaculture research institute and with our partner organization, Wired, who is a large scale uh, permaculture regeneration project. Um, our, throughout the sessions, we, we basically reiterated that the world needs to move on from a sustainable mindset to one of regeneration. Uh, both permaculture and syntropy offer that, obviously. Um, but as there are many more systems of regenerative agriculture out there, as I pointed out, um, they all share a solutions-based elements, um, some of which overlap between permaculture and syntropy. Um, if you could share for our audience, which is my next question, 
um, some of the differences, some of the main points of difference between permaculture, which I think our audience may be more familiar with at this point, um, and syntropy. So what would be some of the main points of difference visually, conceptually, things okay. like that? So for me, it's all connected and interconnected. No one is more important than the other. And, and, um, and I think that it's, for me, they are all like tools that I can have on my toolbox. And, and the more we know, the more we can actually act in, and do better in our practices. So for me, permaculture is a culture of design. You des it's about the human design you can uh, go into permaculture and talk about permaculture for days and months and not even get into uh, food production. It is, uh, you can go into energy efficiency, uh, roads access, uh, so that it, it is so broad, you know, mm -hmm. so big. And um, syntropic farming, it is, uh, pretty much, we are focused on the forest food uh, element, you know. So mm -hmm. it says agroforestry, mm -hmm. so agriculture with forestry. And um, so it, I think that it is part, you definitely can say that uh, Syntropic can be integrated into permaculture. Yes. When you, a lot of uh, people who graduated, who did the permaculture design uh, course, they come to our course right. and to deep, uh, to go deep into the knowledge of, uh, of the forestry element, the food production, and so for me, the main difference are uh, in permaculture, we have zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, where we kind of separate what is the forest element with mm -hmm. the food production. In syntropic farming, now we use the food production, uh, the market garden element to nurture the forest of the future. So it's more, um, we try to integrate more the practices of everything that we try to plant in one spot. So mm -hmm. I tell my students that we try to go for 30 to 50, maybe 100 seeds per square meter, seeds or wow. seedlings. Mm -hmm. So because when you think about one avocado tree, before that avocado tree get there naturally, in a natural environment, how many plants came before to create conditions for that avocado to have a, a better life condition? Mm -hmm. So if you get into a place where it's not a place where the avocado belongs, you got to plant every other plant that can create conditions for it. So that's one of the main differences of permaculture and syntropic farming. It's under, uh, there is no zoning. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I've seen is mechanization. We can use a lot of, um, uh, we are developing more and more um, machinery to right. expand and grow uh, syntropic farming in large scale. So that's another thing that I've seen. And um, what else? Uh, there is ma ma a, lo a lot of difference when you actually start diving into the mm -hmm. principles. There is a lot of similarities as well, but mm -hmm. there is a lot of difference. So, but they are all connected and interconnected. That's what I can say. Absolutely. Um, so one of the main things is that I think uh, both permaculture and syntropy, but syntropy takes it to a new level, is separating out uh, the humans from nature. So uh, absolutely. Um, Conventional agriculture takes humans right out of the equation. Uh, you don't typically live on a commercial farm. Uh, the farmhouse, if, if it is on the same property, is a separate entity, gated off, that sort of thing. Permaculture brings you back into the design to a certain extent, but syntropy really uh, doesn't, it doesn't allow for that separation like you pointed out. So we don't have the zone one is for this, zone two is for that, zone three is for this. Um, it's all sort of integrated into one thing. And your end goal is a fully integrated system where your humans and your forests are as one. 
Yeah. I, yeah, definitely. And if I could right. uh, name something else, imagine yeah. that, that everything that lives in this planet uh, has a function. Right. And and every element that's living now or lived before, they came here to enhance and help life to improve conditions. And then when you think about humans, what is our function in this system? We are here as the uh, catalyzer how to speed up the natural processes. If we understand exactly what is the function of each element, we can put it, we can put it all together and create a um, beautiful food paradise wherever we go. Absolutely. Well, that would be yeah. the dream. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so my next question segues a little bit, but it, it is relative. We, we were talking about separating out different things, um, separating humans from the chain of where our food comes from, essentially. Um, so, so some of the main issues that we're facing right now, uh, certainly prior to COVID, but with a more intensive look after, uh, during and after, is our food production. Um, the public attention has really been drawn in a big way to food security um, and with that climate change as well. So could you elaborate a little bit on how Syntropy combats the issues of climate change and food security? Okay, food security. Uh, when you take the forest out to grow cattle or to grow any monoculture crop, you can only reach certain amount of food production that will come out of that land once a year, maybe twice a year, mm -hmm. you know? So for example, when you grow grains um, of any kind, um, the average yield production is 15 to 20 tons of food per hectare, right. okay? And um, in syntropic farming, if you use, if you design it properly, I've seen systems that produce up to 80 tons, 85 tons of food per hectare. So that's Incredible. your solution there. Um, like pretty <laughs> much four or five times more food production per hectare. And yeah. then also, um, what is the functions of plants in this planet? To do photosynthesis to bring energy and store not only carbon, but a life force in the soil, okay? So for plants to do that, they have to have a system of plants, a community of plants. So one is protecting the other and they all together create a mechanism of not only carbon sequestration, but nutrient cycling, water cycling, and a lot of other things that goes into this mechanism, this engine that makes it work. So when you talk about climate change, if we go out and try to create a machine that can sequester carbon out of the atmosphere, and uh, why would we do that when we have a perfect functioning system that produces food mm -hmm. while it's doing it? So when we can have like another thing is when we talk about um, conventional agriculture they only use one layer they use a hundred percent of that land but they are only using one layer of the for of that space when we do a multi-stratified or multi-layered uh, system we are producing food in at least four or five layers of that forest or that system over time so pretty much that's uh, that's my answer. <laughs> Thanks, that was great. So guys, if you're just joining us in now, um, this is Wired's live living room session. And today uh, we are joined by Tiago Barbosa, who is giving us all of the ins and outs of syntropic farming, which is a regenerative agroforestry met method. Tiago will also be taking questions live from you, our audience, in just a few minutes. So please, as always, Post your questions in the comment section below this video on Facebook or YouTube, and we will be sure to get to as many as we can. I know lots of people are interested in syntropic agriculture at this point. Um, Tiago, for our audience as well, if you can describe a little bit of what a syntropic uh, farming method looks like. So 
starting from the beginning, you're, you're planting in um, a V shape with a lot of seeds and just the idea of the stratification. If you can give us a really quick sort of overview for those who might not be familiar. Okay, uh, basically is we try to mimic exactly what nature does. Um, mm -hmm. In nature, before that huge forest is formed, it always starts from an island of fertility. One little patch of grass, that little grass grows and die, grows and die, grows and die, accumulates energy. And then from that, when there is enough energy there, the birds come in and bring seeds or in the seed bank, that seed sprouts and creates little shrubs, little bushes. And then, and from that, little trees start growing. And then that, that natural succession happens, mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. what we try to do is the same thing. We try to create that island of fertility where we accumulate, so for energy accumulation systems, we try to draw energy out of the air. So we try to uh, create that vortex of energy. So water and nutrients are condensed and uh, drawn into the middle of that vortex. So in that V-shaped garden bed that we make, instead of making a mounded garden bed, we put a concentration of seeds and seedlings that will will be there for the whole duration of the system. Let's say we put a seed that will last. Some plants live for 30 days, some plants live for three months, some plants live for three years, some plants live for 30 years, some plants 300 years. Mm -hmm. So, and each plant occupy different layer in the forest. Some, a lot of the plants, some plants, like to be in the full sun, some plants like to be in the full shade, some plants like to be partly in shade. Mm -hmm. And what we try to understand is what we call natural succession time mm -hmm. and stratification is space. So mm -hmm. through time and space, we select the seeds and seedlings that can live together through time and space. And we put a high concentration of that, that seeds and seedlings in a V-shaped garden bed, and we manage the system. So we create the optimum conditions for each plant in each time of the day life. That's and right, that's yeah. pretty much uh, understanding what is the time and space that that system, and what is the ecophysiology of the plants that we need to be in the system. And then if you understand that, we can put the whole food production in, in place. For example, mm -hmm. we put a lettuce that lives 30 to 50 days with um, broccoli or an eggplant that can live up to one and a half to three years with mm -hmm. a banana that can be there occupying different space with an avocado, with a citrus, with um, a neem tree, with a castor oil plant. With So we put uh, up to a rainforest, a climax forest. We put all these plants together and we manage them. So through time and space, we can harvest the most amount of food while we improve conditions for the uh, each plant that's living at the time. Right. I don't know if so it makes it's, sense, it's Absolutely, it makes well. It makes sense to me. I'm sure we might have more questions from the audience later. But um, what? So it, it's really quite a, a heavy planning process. Um, once you have your design and, and you've designed your system, so you know what your first set of crops are going to be, what your succession planting as it grows, um, what what your end goal is. Um, I believe that's what that's where the major part of the learning will come in 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 in, in receiving syntropic agriculture or doing a workshop with yourself. Um, that's where the main part of your learning is going to come, and then the rest of it is experience based. So it's it's going to be learning how you're doing your your chop and your drop, as we call it in permaculture, anyways, um, for mulching the garden beds and keeping the life cycle of each of those plants um, optimal. So. Um, I, I really liked where you were going with talking about the short-term crops, so your lettuces, things like that, your medium-term crops, the, the next sort of things that come in three months, and then your long-term crops being your trees. Um, this is where the market gardening aspect of Syntropy comes into place. Um, and that's where I feel it, it really does differ quite a bit from permaculture because that's built into the system. Um, in yeah, a permaculture... 
and we use different terminology as well. So the market garden, we call them the placenta of the system. Yes. You know, yes. where the placenta, where the baby stays in the mom's womb. So they yeah. come to create conditions and to nurture that little seedlings that normally we have them in the greenhouse mm -hmm. somewhere out there. Separated so we, out, yeah. Yeah, so actually we put the seeds with the, the market garden there. Mm -hmm. So they create the conditions uh, the optimum conditions, the the best ever greenhouse that you could ever have yeah. <laughs> for that that for, uh, plant of the future. There, perfect. And so, therefore, you're you're harvesting crops at different times, uh, which leads me into my next question, which is um, relating the difference between uh, conventional agriculture and uh, syntropy from an economic standpoint, could you sell us on utilizing syntropic principles instead of conventional agriculture from an economic standpoint? So from the standpoint of the farmer, um, being able to produce that uh, consistent income. Okay, first of all, if you have uh, better nutritious food, you're definitely gonna have uh, better, um, you definitely will be, uh, you definitely will, put, will have better market for it, okay? So mm -hmm. if you're growing organic, definitely you will have um, a better price for your food, okay? If you have multi-crops there, definitely you're gonna have different source of income over time. Um, in this, uh, all, all year round and so for the economic point of view, okay, um, let's say that you're producing sugar cane or you're producing banana and out of the blue, you have a disease that wipe out all your crop and then you have to wait another year or another season to plant everything. And, but if you have uh, multi-crop, uh, multi-source uh, of income coming out of that land, you definitely will have uh, more money coming out of that. Um, you need to understand how it works because a lot of people, they are specialized in one culture. A lot of people, they grow cacao uh, for 10, 20 years. A lot of people grow pineapples for 10, 20 years. Once you start putting five, 10, 20 different cultures together. There is a deep understanding in that, but it is beautiful to, when you understand how the system works and you can have different sources of income. Um, another thing is a lot of people say that's a lot of work to start a system like that. But the way that I see it is um, different, we shift the workload instead of uh, coming every week and spraying your crop you're coming every week to manage it and instead of um instead of uh coming every week to water or every two days to water your system you you don't do that you come every second every third day to see how your system is going to pay attention how the plants are performing so how would I convince people to change their practices? I think they got to eat the food that they are growing. And a lot of people that are growing uh, conventionally, they, they kind of don't eat the food that they produce because they know how much poison they put on the produce. So that's one of the reasons why. And the other reason is when you have different source of income over time, that would definitely will give you more security when you're planting. Okay. Um, okay. I think Jane uh, <laughs> is not here. Uh, okay, guys. Um, why do I love syntropic farming that much? Okay. It, when you go to a conventional farm, you see a lot of machines working and no people around, okay, that gives a different sense of life. When you walk into a farm where 
that is more people working, definitely you're going to have a little bit more costs in costs in that. Um, but definitely you have more diversity, more work for these people to do at the farm. And there is more life involved. And um, I went on a tour here in Australia to see cotton farms. When you go and see a cotton farm, large scale cotton farm here, it feels like you are out of out of the space, you know. People walking around with space space uh, suits full of poison all day. You cannot go at this time of the day. It depends where the wind's blowing. You cannot uh, drive through because of the amount of poison that they use. So when you go to an organic cotton farm, when you see people playing around, people driving around, kids playing around around the crops. And that's, for me, that's the answer. If you can't be walking normally in your own land and you cannot drink the water <laughs> out of your own land, why bother working just for money? And you make all this money and at the end of the day, you're gonna spend all this money in the at the hospitals and that's it <laughs> sorry about that for a second tiago i just had a quick um, technical issue which i'm still fixing apparently that's all good <laughs> um so guys if you're just joining us in this is Ward's live living room sessions. Today on our second last episode, we are joined by Tiago Barbosa, who is giving us all of the ins and outs of Syntropic Farming, a regenerative agroforestry method. Tiago will be taking questions live from the audience after I ask him just one more. Mm -hmm. um, so please remember to post your questions and comments in this section below the video on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube while you are there. Sorry for the technical glitches for just a second here. I hope you are all hearing me very well. Yeah. Um, so my next or my final question to you, Tiago, is um, how can we ensure that the message that you're giving us today in terms of um, the, the the possibilities and the use of regenerative agriculture. Um, how do how can we ensure that the message you're giving us today is carried out? How do we how do we in, as individuals get involved, and how can we make a lasting change? In your opinion, do we need to start from the top down with policy, or do we start from the bottom up um, in educating the farmers um, uh, and essentially the consumers of the world? So, how do we make a lasting change? What are our first steps? Um, the answer for that is very close to you guys there. I went to Curaçao last, uh, I think uh, last year to set up a system on the island of Curaçao. And then I walked around the island and I couldn't see much food produ pr production on the island, you know, and, um, but I could see um, the government, they were really proud of building many, many hospitals and plans to build a lot of hospitals down the track. So pretty much, if you're not looking into the food that you're eating, you're better, gonna, you're better pay attention where you're going to spend your money in the future at the hospitals, you know. So if you eat, and uh, if you ever had a chance to take, to pick a tomato out of the plant and taste it, you never again will want a tomato from the supermarket, you know? So I think that all starts from the consumer, okay? Um, every company, they want to sell it. If they don't sell, they don't have a business. They don't have business. So if the consumers can uh, set the tone, and demand healthy and nutritious food that will change the whole food chain. People will definitely, um, the, the, the companies will think twice how they are producing. Then, then the supermarkets will think twice how they are displaying this food with 
you see a lot here we started talking about no plastics policies um, not long ago that was like five years ago or less probably that we went very heavily on this plastic free and you see in a lot of countries they are creating policies now of reducing um, uh, single use single use plastics so that's the same with food well you see a lot of people demanding um, organic food at the supermarkets and you see on the shelves the space that they have for organic food now it's growing and yeah more people searching and helping farmers you know um, that's another a very good point and to see this changing this change lasting you know to help people who are producing and go and ask them how they are producing you know i was um where was i uh, ah yeah i was um, in belize not long ago just before the covid uh, and then i saw that i went imagine belize the rainforest and to even find fresh produce, not, I'm not even talking organic, <laughs> just to find fresh produce was very hard. And then when you go and ask people at the markets, at the shops, say, uh, is that organic? They look at you as you, if you're asking for something out of this planet, say, organic? Why organic? So, but it comes with, with us asking the right questions to the people who are producing, and then they will, they will stick on their mind. Oh, people are asking for organic. Oh, people are asking how I produce. People are asking to come to my farm. I don't want them to see how much poison I put in my food. You know, and that's how I see it. Absolutely, and uh, we work quite closely with uh, Slow Food Barbados, and that is one of their main um, points that they're trying to get across to the public as well, is uh, ask your farmer. So vote with your fork, is the saying. Uh, by choosing sustainable, regenerative, organic foods, uh, you're saying to the farmers that that's what you'd prefer. That's it. Uh, other day here, uh, I saw a guy selling strawberries on the streets. And I asked him if he was the one who produces it. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very pr proud to he was the farmer. And I said, I, and then I asked him, do you eat it? Do you give to your kids? And straight away I could see on their face like, oh, yeah, they, they want, he wanted to say yes, but I knew that he don't because he knows how much poison he puts on his strawberry. So he wouldn't put in his mouth. So well, that's a really good way to ask, ask the farmers, ask them how they're producing it. Absolutely, it's a very good indication. So uh, guys, I know that we have some questions from our audience and I wanna make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. So uh, Tiago, if you're ready, we will get our first question up from the audience. Yeah. Uh, this one's from Earl. Earl, so thank you, thank you so much for joining us on YouTube. Um, because you plant seeds all at the same time, you have to keep creating new beds. Is there a minimum area or number of beds that you have to create to feed a small family? That's a good question because we do have many small farmers, uh, small holdings here in Barbados especially, um, mm -hmm. who would be interested in this answer. Uh, so there is no recipe, okay? It depends on the size of the family and what do you want to feed your family and what's the area that you have. Basically, is you got to divide your whole area, and with that area, you're gonna use the space to. It's kind of the holistic management methodology, you know, where you always keep changing your animals from area to area, and then they come back to the area one once right. the area is fully regrown. So basically, that's how I see that. If you have 10 acres or five hectares, whatever, you start with um, half of an acre, half of a hectare, and then you create that for the season. You start growing that for the season, and then you do another five, um, half an acre, then you do another half an acre, and then over in 10 years, you're gonna get up to the five hectares, and then you go back to area one again, prune everything, and then start again with, all your seeds and seedlings and keeping the plants that you want to keep in your system. So it depends a lot, Earl. Um, depends on uh, what, how big is the area that you have. 
and what is the aim that you want so you want to keep on growing market gardens okay you don't you have to put less fruit trees so you can constantly prune them and open space for more sunlight to come through so you can always grow your veggies as well that would be my, my my answer for that perfect that's great so we do have lots of questions from our audience um mm -hmm. We'd love to get to as many of them as possible. So our next one is on Facebook from Joan Charles. Thanks for joining us, Joan. Um, thank you very much, she says. Excellent presentation. Do you have a website or YouTube channel that we can refer to for additional learning? That's a good question because everybody is seeking uh, education online these days. Okay, I have a Facebook page uh, where I share a lot of uh, the things that's happening here. It's called Syntropic Farms um, with an S. I think that's Syntropic Farms, word of Syntropic Farms Australia. And that is uh, my Instagram page as well. That's uh, Syntropic Farms Word. And there you can talk to me. I'll be more than happy to share uh, PDFs and even do uh, what we call uh, mentorship. So I've been doing a lot of um, online mentorship at the moment uh, where people want to have their own plan for their own land. So we do a plan for them and we try to teach people because it's so much to learn. Like I'm still learning, you know, <laughs> so it's so much to learn, but it's good to get started at some point. And definitely if you get in touch with me on uh, Facebook or Instagram, I'll be more than happy to share um, PDFs and PDF materials that I have. And also there is a lot of videos of me talking on YouTube as well. If you put uh, my full name, Tiago Jimenez Barbosa, Tiago Syntropic or Tiago Barbosa Syntropic, you might find a lot of material on YouTube. A lot of the classes that I've been giving over the years, people are recording it and putting it on YouTube. Perfect. And we will absolutely place uh, all of your contact info in the discussion on our uh, on all of these various feeds today um, and ensure that you have that ability to chat with people. I think that ongoing information with regards to Syntropy is, is important. That's what a lot of people are looking for. We can, we can all, you know, YouTube a, a, a starter sort of idea of it, but it's to be able to have that person to ask questions to as we go um, in developing a system. Yes. Oh, Joan Charles has, oh, she has a secondary, sorry, I just noticed that. Also, could syntropic farming be used in a backyard garden? That's an excellent question as well with relation to the space that a lot of people have here in Barbados. You can definitely use the principles of syntropic farming to improve your uh, home garden that you already have. For example, understanding the natural succession and stratification, you can optimize the space and put more plants per square meter, definitely. And yeah, basically you can definitely use um, uh, the principles of syntropic farming, but to, by understanding what is the function of each plant how you can optimize the space and time in your in your home garden. Absolutely. So our next question is from Farnukeo One on YouTube. Tiago, do you feel like syntropic farming techniques varies vastly from bioregion to bioregion? So the difference between Brazil versus Australia is what she's getting at. Uh, pretty much the principles are the same. The way um, my wife is a chef, and I, I give this example when I'm teaching a course, the way that she bakes a cake in Australia and the way that she bakes a cake in Brazil is the same. <laughs> it's just, uh, but we use different ingredients depending on the season and where we can find the ingredients. But basically, it's to bake a cake, you need an oven, you need a tray, you need flour, you need some sort of liquid. And so the ingredients, they change from place to place, but the principles, they are the same. In syntropic farming, principles are the same. If you understand the natural succession, time, the stratification, space, if you understand um, how, what is the optimum conditions that each plant needs in each time of their lifetime, 
you can actually definitely use um, whatever it's growing on that bioregion to grow whatever you need, you need to grow. You don't want to grow bananas in Alaska. You know that's never going to grow, <laughs> you know? And the same as when you try to grow broccoli uh, in the middle of summer in the Caribbean island. So it's never going to grow as well. So you got to try to find what grows in that area and uh, and then play with what is growing there at the time and at the season that's growing. Excellent. Uh, we have lots of questions, so I want to make sure this next one is from Angie M. Very interesting topic and very useful information, especially for my pending move to the Caribbean. Oh, well, welcome in the future, Angie. Um, what are known drawbacks? So things to look out for when doing this type of farming in the hot Caribbean climate. It's um, in my, I tell people that don't wait to plant. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things if you don't plant you're never gonna have anything growing you know and it's better to have a system growing with too much or too little than not having a system at all you know and even if you get it all wrong imagine you put all the plants and suddenly out of the blue some plants are going well some plants are not doing well what you can do is prune everything chop and drop put everything back on the ground and start all over again and when you start again that soil will be 10 times better than it was when you first started but if you never plant if you never start the soil will be the same so yeah the best thing that i can say is start as soon as you can start playing with the plants because i can talk all day about how eggplant plant looks like in every time of uh, their life but once you see it, you know what are you seeing, you know how it looks like in each time, you know, and um, you only will know how your soil fertility is when you start playing with it. And you only know if a plant will grow in your area if you start planting them. And that's how I see things. Okay, and there are, depending on another down uh, point here as well, is depending on how big you wanna grow, you know, um, you want to go a big garden and you don't have machinery, you might end up with a big forest there and you don't have time to manage it. So that is definitely, it's not paradise. You're just going to go there, put plants on the ground. They were going to grow beautifully and abundantly. It's a learning process. And the earlier you start planting, the earlier you start learning. Great. So our next question is from Wizzy John. When starting a syntropic system, do all the seeds and plants have to be put into the system at the same time? This yes. Is a major difference. Um, ideally, ideally, that's what we want because that is a synchronization principle that we use in syntropic farming as well. So, for example, um, there are plants that they need to be in place before the other plants sprouts so they are already up there creating condition for the juvenile plant when they are uh, sprouting or growing so as i as i keep saying time and space uh, it's a beautiful uh, way of seeing it because if you put a plant out of time they are not going to be fulfilling their function in the system and if you put the plant at the right time but out of space there will be a gap in the space that and it's uh, pretty much we try to synchronize the system try to put all the seeds and seedlings at the same time so they can all together create what we call a web of life that can support that amount of life that's uh, gonna grow in that system so we try to put everything at the same time but when you talk at the same time, it's not actually at the same food. Sometimes you don't have the seeds or you don't have the seedlings. It might be two days, three days, a week or two weeks. Sometimes we put a seedling and wait for that plant sprout to already have a little canopy. So, and then you put another seedling in, in place. So yeah, that is ideally it's at the same time, but time it's different for different situations. Watch you. 
Our next question is from Christina Pooler. Uh, she asks, can syntropic farming work for farmers who do not own the land they farm on? Uh, so no permanent structure, short leases, landowner might not want trees on their property. What combination of trees and plants would you recommend men to use in a syntropic system in this case? I did that uh, in a project that uh, the guy was uh, leasing, the, leasing the land and we went with so let's say that as i said time goes on and we gotta work with succession ideally is you want to go as further on succession as possible up to 30 years or more if you can but in some cases you don't have that time or the land's not yours so you can use plants like pigeon peas, uh, acacias, uh, bananas, to create that biomass. Basically, so the currency of this universe is energy, okay? And the energy that comes to this planet, the energy that comes to us, uh, our beautiful, healthy body, can only come to us through plants. And the plants absorb this energy from the sun. So when we're growing plants, we need to have this uh, maximum, this uh, optimum of life force, of energy accumulation in the soil. So the plants are able to cycle nutrients and water from that soil, from that environment. So what we try to do is plant it very dense, not only plants, because we tend to think that we need a lot of plants that we can harvest. But a lot of these plants, they are, uh, taking out energy out of the soil we need more plants that can bring in energy to the soil so that's what we try to create here so what i suggest you to put plants that have a um, short life cycle like one two three five years and then use that plants uh, always go for plants that when you prune them they reshoot very fast they are the ones who can produce a lot of energy in form of matter, organic matter. And then you chop and drop and then you accumulate, you create that islands of fertility so the plants can have that amount of life force to grow healthy, healthy and happy. That's great. Um, and I just had this conversation with a farmer not too long ago about how uh, trees are not permanent structures either. So you can um, absolutely plant trees on land that is not yours. They can be pruned right back to nothing as well. Definitely. So MDMX on uh, YouTube would like to know how important is it to start to start with seeds compared to seedlings? So why do you start with the actual seed as opposed to a small plant? Um, the transplant. Transplanting a seed, they always cause a little trauma or uh, distress for the plants. But as we know, as we all know, it's very hard to find seeds and seedlings <laughs> at the time that you actually need it. So I'm not uh, fussy at all about uh, choosing only seeds or only seedlings. I use everything that I can get my hands on at the time, okay? So I just plant everything, seeds and seedlings together as much as I can. Um, I try not to go for big seedlings because, um, as you know, on the human perspective, when you have a little, when you have a trauma, when you are little, it affects your whole adulthood life. So that would be the same for the plants. If you distress a plant, if you traumatize a plant, because imagine that seedlings, you have that seedling on the greenhouse, always nurture, being, always having water twice a day, getting fertilizers once a week, once a month. And then you take that plant out of that paradise <laughs> and put that plant on the ground where we'll be having water once a week or once in a while, that will create a sort of a trauma in the plant. So we want to create less stress as possible when you are creating a system. And But I'm not fussy at all. Seeds or seedlings all together at the same time.
Right. So we have another question from Earl. Um, are there differences of how you apply syntropic agriculture to repairing degraded land to farming? Is the land use and inputs different? So each case is a case. Uh, one of uh, my mentor, Ernest Gutsch, when you ask him, uh, hey, Ernest, what should I do there? What should we do there? He first thing that he says, I don't know, I'm not there. I need to see. <laughs> he actually needs to see what actually you have growing in the area first. You need to see how that soil is growing. And it all comes, definitely it is different. So the approach uh, when we do to repairing land and to when you're putting food production in place. But the principles, they are all the same. We try to um, concentrate energy, putting a lot of plants that will import energy into the place, import uh, life force. And it all comes back to the design. But the design can change as well over time. So you can start thinking that you're going to have food production, like it's going to be a farm. But as you do that, you put a lot of seeds and then start growing. And then you forget about that land and that will become a forest. And that's, uh, that can change as well. So Errol, he came to our workshop in, in Curaçao and he fell in love with syntropic farming. And I love the questions that he puts out there. He's really taking it to the next level in Trinidad Tobago. And he's really applying the principles, you know. You tell him to put it very dense. He's like, oh, my God, more plants? Yeah, I'll do it. And he goes and do that. It sounds like a lot of work when you start doing that at the beginning. But once you get used to understand how nature works, you want to do more and more and more. And uh, I love what he's doing there. Thanks, Errol. You're awesome. That's great. Um, and our next question is from Edgewaters on YouTube. Can you recommend any online documentation, publications, or courses, persons who you can learn from to know more about syntropic farming? I think uh, we were supposed to be there in Barbados next month, in August, if the COVID-19 hasn't striked out. We're supposed to be there last month, next month, uh, wasn't it? I think that was uh, August when we were supposed to be there. So I normally go to the Caribbean islands uh, twice a year, uh, Central America and Caribbean islands. So let's wait to see how this whole travel situation will be uh, in a few months. But I definitely have a few projects going in Curaçao, Costa Rica, Belize, and Trinidad Tobag with A. Earl. So we're supposed to be running workshops in Trinidad Tobago and Barbados next month. So it got postponed. Uh, we don't know yet when. <laughs> I definitely have a course booked in Costa Rica in June ne next year. That uh, supposed to be in June this year that we postponed to next year. But definitely come to one of the courses. If you want to know anything online, uh, talk to me. I'll be more than happy to do a mentorship program with you. Um, and yeah, and then I can send you a lot of the material that I have here. That's very, very easy to read, very easy to grasp the knowledge. Thank you. Perfect. So we just have one more question that we're going to try and get to before the end of our session. Uh, this one is from Angie M. Can you drop and leave the sick clippings on the soil? Um, the, it depends uh, which, uh, which kind of disease it is. There are some diseases that they are very, very, very bad. They spread it so fast that I wouldn't do that. But normally when I'm just working on the daily base uh, just chop and drop everything you know and um, the, a lot of the disease they are mainly fungus or bacteria and when you put on the ground it's going to be full of life and fungus and bacteria as well that they can actually 
balance it out or uh, equalize the level of bugs and bacteria and fungs, fungi that they have on the soil. So the, the answer for this question is it depends. If I know that the disease can spread it very widely and very fast, I wouldn't. But if I know that would be, um, that, that I don't know what type of disease it is. If I'm just in a hurry, I just chop and drop, yeah. Perfect. So we just have, we're going to squeeze in our very last question. This one is from Mel. How can we encourage more people to eat locally grown organic food when the local farmers can't compete with the imported prices? That is a, a million dollar question. Um, just try to taste the food that comes from America or Europe and taste the food that has just been picked yesterday, <laughs> you know, and definitely you got to find that, that love for the food first, you know. Um, the, someone has to pay the bills in terms of the damage that we do in this planet. <laughs> you know, like for me, sometimes I pay a little bit more to not have the one that's fully wrapped in plastic, the produce that's fully wrapped in plastic. I know that I'm paying a little bit more sometimes, but it's um, my contribution for the whole chain of effects that my action can have in the system. So I know that's hard when you need to put food on your table and you know, but it's um, the price is, uh, if it's very, very cheap, normally, we should be really concerned about that. Like I was in Curaçao last year, and then I asked for a plate, like for a dish that was full of broccoli. And then in my mind, because I know how bro what broccoli needs to be grown, I start thinking, said, oh, oh my God, what is the closest place that could grow broccoli here? And then I thought about um, Andes, or Central America, South America, North America or Europe or New Zealand or <laughs> and I start thinking and said, oh my God, imagine how much this food travel to be here in my plate now, how much preservatives it has. Uh, and then next time that I went there, I just didn't order the same dish again. I started ordering uh, local food, like what do you have that's local here? They had fish. So I started eating fish, you know. So yeah, so the answer for that question is think what the contribution that you can have for the next generations and your money is like your vote, you know, for what what the companies uh, can display, what they are looking for are co consumers and we are the consumers. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tiago, for joining us. Thank you so much for getting out of bed. The answers to all these questions have been phenomenal. Uh, we've had great engagement from the from the audience. Um, we'll make sure that we're posting uh, Tiago's uh, contact information, as we said, in the discussion on our um, streams. And um, we wish you all the best. And we hope to see you soon in Barbados, hopefully, for a course which CPRI would love to run um, in, in the near future. We had one planned, but unfortunately, COVID hit. So we have to re-gauge what we're doing now. So um, thank, thank you so much for joining us in this space. Um, and I hope you can get some sleep before the morning. <laughs> now it's 4 o'clock now. It's time to go to the farm. That's the best time to get out there. <laughs> So thank you for the opportunity okay, to, so thank you. You. thanks for having me here. Uh, uh, I'm really connected to this area of the planet, you know. It's funny that I mean, I'm from Brazil, I live in Australia, and a lot of the work that I do is in Central America at the moment. And I love the people, I love the area, I love the climate, it's really cold up here now. <laughs> I love to be out in the sun and thank you for this opportunity for the work that you're doing I've been following you 
not at this time, but I've been following <laughs> you, the work that you're doing, and we need more people like you doing this, putting more information out there. Because I think one thing that I forgot to say about Syntropic Farming is the best input that we have in the systems, doesn't matter where we are, is knowledge. That's what we try to have as much inputs as possible, and that's knowledge. And the more knowledge that you can spread to the people who want to grow food in their backyard or even in their, their little pot, um, the more they know, the more they can share, more uh, consciousness can grow and more awareness can be created. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiago. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been watching throughout our 25 episodes of Wired's live living room sessions as well. We've been doing this session over the last few months. And as we draw to the close of our bi-weekly sessions, we invite you to join us on Thursday, July the 9th, that's this Thursday at 1 p.m. as our team, Keisha, Patrick, and myself wrap up all of our discussions that we've had with our wide variety of experts in an episode entitled Creating Meaningful Change. What role should you be playing? As always, each of our episodes in this series are available to view on Wired's YouTube channel, as well as our respective Facebook pages if you missed any parts of today's session or any of our sessions thus far. We encourage you to go back through, have a watch if you've missed any, and we look forward to seeing you on Thursday at 1 for our final episode. Take care until then.